equity and inclusion work is more important now than ever. And in this session, we're going to talk about why it's so important for state agencies and give you specific examples of agency programs that are connecting with diverse audiences. We're also going to talk about the, the real barriers. You might as well acknowledge them. The barriers that diverse newcomers face when getting started fishing. And we're going to explore some additional tips for engaging these audiences. Please welcome from the RBFF. It is Stephanie Valera, who's going to provide some additional information about this session. And she's going to introduce her collaborators. Oh. Good afternoon, workshop attendees. Thank you for joining us. I'm Stephanie Vadalero, and I'm honored and humbled to introduce your next session, welcoming diverse audiences to the water, why it's important and where to start. In this session, I'm gonna kick things off with a brief presentation to define diversity and talk about why it's important on the national level. Then you're going to get a state agency perspective from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, David Bugs. Last but not least, you're going to get that new angler perspective from Awkward Angler podcast host and diversity consultant, Erica Nelson. Let's dive in. While diversity has long been important in our workforce and in our outreach, really in all aspects of our life, today we find it's really imperative. Let's start by defining diversity. Diversity is the practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds. It includes all the ways in which people differ, encompassing characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. We can't have diversity without equity inclusion, so let's hit on those as well. Equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to eliminate barriers that have prevented the participation of some groups. Moving on to inclusion, inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued to fully participate. Why is DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, important on a national level? I'm in no way an expert on this, so I'm gonna lay out some national stats for you to consider, and then I'm gonna let the experts dive into the details. Census Bureau data shows nearly four of 10 Americans identify with a race or ethnic group other than white. It also suggests that the 2010 to 2020 decade will be the first in the nation's history in which the white population declined in numbers. As a percentage of the national population, whites are already shrinking while minorities are growing. If you take a look at this chart, you'll see in 1980, white residents comprised almost 80% of the national population, with black residents accounting for 11.5%, Latino or Hispanic residents at 6.5%, and Asian Americans at 1.8%. 2019 data shows the white population share has continued to decline, in 2019, it was at 60.1%. Latino and Hispanic and Asian American population shares showed the most marked gains at 18.5% and nearly 6% respectively. Yet, when you Google the word fishing, and I challenge you to do that, this is what you see. Take a look at the screen. There's 17 images here. Do you see diversity? Not really. What I'm seeing is mostly white participants, maybe one Latino in there, uh, mostly male participants. There's a couple of females here and mostly adults. I'm counting three kids. 
Try putting yourselves in the shoes of a young black, Latino, or Asian woman, let's say, and tell me what about these search results would speak to you. Would these images give you the sense that you belong? Maybe not. And that's why we're talking about this here today. We know you face many challenges in your state agencies, and you're not alone. Many companies resist putting the wheels in motion on a DEI plan because they don't feel like they have time. Maybe they don't have the budget for it. And some people think it's just not needed. Why should we bother? Sound familiar? There are a lot of great reasons to embrace diversity in your agencies and in your outreach. And that's why it's an important topic we wanted to talk about at this year's workshop. We've brought together two fantastic panelists to talk about why diversity is important to your agencies and how you can get started. First up, David Bugs. David is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, where he develops and manages the execution of the diversity and inclusion strategy. He's also the former Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for FedEx Office. He's an accomplished cultural compliance and management professional with years of experience in the area of relationship building, leadership development, mentoring, training, and executive coaching. David earned his BS in marketing from Southern University and has an MBA from Baylor. He also completed the executive development program at the University of Texas Red McComb School of Business. David has served on several boards in the conservation, fish, and wildlife space, currently serving as the Diversity and Inclusion Committee co-chair for AFWA. Let's welcome David, who's going to talk about why DE&I is important for state agencies and how you can get started. Good morning. My name is David Bugs. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Texas Parks and Wildlife. And this morning I've been given a few minutes to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to me. And hopefully it's one that you all have been focusing on as well. What we're going to talk about today is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why it's important to state conservation agencies and where you can get started if you haven't started already. So first of all, we all know that the U.S. population has been growing and changing and becoming more and more ethnically diverse. When we look at the younger generations, there's greater racial diversity among millennials and those Gen Xers and Gen Zs. Also, there's been a decline in the majority white population so why should we care? Well, first of all, America has become, and the world, more and more urban. Actually, in the US, the statistics say that we are 83% urban. Also, there's been a decline in natural resource majors. When you start looking at STEM majors across the board, there's about 11% growth in other STEM fields, but in natural resources, it's about 6%. So we're falling behind some of the other STEM areas. Also, there's added value when we start talking about diverse perspectives in scientific discovery and programming and so forth. There's an overall health benefit to all of us and cost reduction, we're engaged in nature and the data proves that. Also, when we start engaging in the outdoors and in conservation, we recognize that there are some other challenges that we're facing, climate change and other things, and it's everybody's issue. Also, the relevance of fish and wildlife agencies is starting to be challenged, and we've got to make sure this new demographic or this expanding demographic is on board with what we're trying to do and understands the value that we add to conservation. So what else is at stake? And this is very important. Fish and wildlife conservation is fueled by participant dollars. This is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry that we can't afford to lose. We know that we have sports fish restoration and wildlife restoration and federal duck stamps 
state license fees and all of those different things are important to our agencies and make sure it upholds the industry. But our typical customer base has been declining in some areas, especially hunting. We know that hunting has been declining for a number of years. And fishing is doing pretty well, but it's been stagnant also for decades. When we look at some of the trends over the last 13 years, we see that fishing has had some ebbs and flows, but for the most part, it's been pretty steady. Also, when we look at who's participating in some of those fishing and outdoor activities, it's the majority group. If you look to the far right, that is engaged more than other groups. But we also talked about earlier, that majority group is declining. So the question is, how do natural resource agencies who support and are engaged in conservation activity become relevant to this growing and changing population without losing current participants and supporters. Now, I just want to share something with you. And this is kind of a myth for a lot of folks that people of color don't care about the outdoors. Well, I'll tell you, we all started in an agrarian background. We have an agrarian heritage. And we were engaged in the outdoors, be it for recreation or even for commercial purposes. We all have that appreciation in us. Now, our country went through a lot of economic changes in the 40s, all the way through the 70s. And most of us who grew up in those rural areas and had a focus on natural resource preservation started to migrate to a lot of the urban areas. Now, there are several reasons that we did this. First of all, there was a shift in the type of labor that was available. There was a lack of land. There were restrictions on ownership for certain groups. Also, there were some economic challenges that all of us face, some self-imposed and some from external forces. Now, another issue around engaging the outdoors for a lot of people of color is personal safety. And if you look at the uh, America's wildlife values and when you start looking at the survey that was done about uh, by the DJ Chase, it tells you a little bit more about the issues around personal safety and outdoors for people of color. Also media influences. We didn't see people that look like us in a lot of the shows that were on television. So for various reasons, a lot of people of uh, ethnically diverse backgrounds didn't engage in what we call conservation. But one of the things that you'll notice if you go to any urban area, there's still an intrinsic appreciation for nature and the outdoors in all of us. So why people diversity in conservation? Well, people diversity attracts and retains new talent. It helps us create a message around conservation that's effective and able to relate to some of the folks that we're trying to reach. It also helps us look at our programming and our services differently and make sure that those things are engaging to the audiences we're trying to reach. It attracts new customers, both local, regional, and international. It also increases the value of our organizations to its constituents and to those folks that uh, those demographics are putting in office. And it also helps us expand our outdoor recreation activities for youth and adults. And lastly, it brings about more of a cultural understanding. Now, one of the things that I wanna make sure that we're clear on, this is not a zero sum game issue. It's not an issue where if certain other folks are brought in and they start enjoying it, that other people lose. It's a win for everybody. But here's the problem. It's sometimes difficult to solve a problem until you acknowledge that you may be part of the problem you're trying to solve. So here's some things that you need to focus on. You first of all need to be intentional about the efforts that you're engaging in. It shouldn't be just a one-off situation. Also, you have to be accommodating for folks that you're trying to bring in. Everybody doesn't have the same background and the same way of doing things in the outdoors as you do. You've got to listen to those different groups and find out what's important to them. You've got to have those images that look like the people you're trying to reach. 
and also find other organizations that are already engaged in what you're trying to do to reach out to those diverse audiences. And most of all, the media has to be the right type of media to reach those different audiences. So one of the things that we've done in the past, we engage different groups and this has been years in the making we've engaged different groups to come in work in conservation but what we're facing right now is what we call a silver tsunami a lot of those folks that we reached out to of diverse backgrounds years ago are either retiring or nearing retirement carter smith who is the executive director for Texas Parks and Wildlife said something that we found very important to all of us. He said diversity is part and parcel of what makes our mission, our work and our service so unique and special to our state and to all of its citizens. So how can we address this diversity and inclusion challenge in conservation? Well, there's five areas that we'd like to focus on for just a minute or two careers, programming, peers, volunteers, and like we talked about earlier, media. First of all, when we start talking about inclusion in careers, we've got to first of all examine how we're pursuing different folks for those careers that we have inside of our agency. Are we being mindful of the broader diaspora of folks that are getting different types of education? Are we focusing just specific areas with specific schools or specific uh, people that are in different jobs that are already doing the work? Also, we've got to make sure that we get outside of our comfort zone and reach out to those different groups that we say we want to be included in what we do. We need to make sure that we evaluate what we're requiring of folks and we're not seeing lower the standards. We're talking about adapting to changes in society and adapting to what's being taught in different schools and in different areas. And again, we talked about this earlier, we've got to be intentional. It can't be a one off or we tried that and it didn't work, so we're not going to do it anymore. You have to be consistent. Also, we need to develop some mentoring opportunities and some internship opportunities. Now, we already have those for a lot of folks that we have inside of our agency now. But how about expanding those opportunities to those diverse audiences? And the other thing, again, and I will harp on this, is we've got to have some inclusive images in everything that we put out in the public. Now, here's just an example of a few, just a handful of the TPWD team members that are doing an excellent job reaching out to that broader public. The other thing that's very important is programming. Now, we're very excited about the Vamos a Pascar grant that we receive every year. We've done a really good job of reaching out to some of the markets across the state of Texas. Six major markets that we've been reaching out to are Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Brownville, Huntsville, and El Paso. And we've been conducting certain activities virtually from our Texas Freshwater Fisheries Center to increase the exposure of our agencies to these new families. We've also been engaging in something that we're very excited about. And this is just one activity, but it's huge for us. It's called neighborhood fishing. And I'll tell you just about a couple of places. First of all, Houston. And Houston is one of the most diverse metropolitan areas in the nation. And we recognize that not everybody is interested in catching trophy bass. So what we've done is we set out to work with the folks in those communities, find out what are some of those types of fish that they enjoy catching, uh, put those fish in those areas that are away from those high traffic areas, and then share the information about what's included in those particular water bodies, along with different safety tips and other types of information close to those water bodies. And it's been extremely successful. We've also been doing some really good work in the DFW area, similar to the Houston area. And we're very excited about what's going on there. One of the things that we did in addition to just supplying fish and providing signage and people to talk to, we've engaged in a partnership with Texas Tech University. They're going out and polling folks that are in those parks around those water bodies that are engaging different activities, whether they're anglers or non-anglers, and finding out what is it that they enjoy doing. 
if they had an opportunity to go out and to fish, what is it that they would love to do while they're engaged in those activities and what would get them to stay? The next thing is very important to us is recruitment of volunteers and instructors in our partnerships. So first of all, I just wanna share with you some of our partners. This is a short list of some of our partners, but what's really important to us is to make sure that we have partners that are already engaged in some of those activities that we're looking to share with that broader public. And if you look in our upper right-hand corner of the slide, here's a picture that I've circled of just a few of our partners. One of our most important partners, but all of our partners are important, but here's a guy that is really able to help us in a lot of different ways. His name is Mr. Willard Franklin. He owns an organization called the Four W's. And what makes Mr. Franklin unique is he's an African-American male that also has an organization that does saltwater fishing surveys and saltwater fishing expeditions. He also does freshwater fishing, but he also helps us with hunter safety, with boater safety and archery. So he's an all around outdoors guy. Also one of the things that we've been doing a lot of is making sure that we're engaging young people as volunteers that also are part of the demographic we're trying to reach out to. Now, shameless plug, the guy on the far right and on the far left, well, not the big guy, the other guy, the slim guy, is my youngest son, and I'm very excited about his participation. The other thing that we've done is made sure that some of our more government organizations are participating with us as well. If you look in the lower left corner, you see some of our Coast Guards that are engaged in some of the activities we're doing outdoors in those diverse areas. And if you look in the lower, lower right-hand corner, you see that smiling face that is Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner, and he's always excited to give us a hand. Now, the other thing that we've done that I think is huge, we've established what we call non-traditional university partnerships. These are partnerships with historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving universities, and women institutes. And what we do there is we go and we share with the students some of the things that we're doing. We provide instructions and certifications on different types of boater ed, hunter ed, uh, water safety ed, and all those sort of things. I and mean, what that does for us, it increases the number of volunteers for Texas Parks and Wildlife. It also increases the diversity of those volunteers, which we're very excited about. It also helps those students develop a conservation awareness and it increases the diverse talent pool for our agency. And we're also excited about that. And the other part is it helps decrease the cost of engagement to those different communities that we're trying to, to, to grab and bring into conservation. The other piece that's very important that we talked about earlier is a part of the media piece is our advertising of boater safety, aquatic ed, uh, angler ed, and talk a little, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it uh, maximizes inclusion. So first of all, when you doing the outreach, it needs to be bilingual. It needs to be in local newsletters, in local businesses. Also, Hispanic television is a very important place and radio. Now, here's something that's a little different. We also are reaching out to different worship centers and talking to their congregations about what we do and how they engage in outdoors. The other thing is urban schools and the Boys and Girls Clubs. Now, here's a statement that I've heard several times. A young lady, a young African-American lady shared this with me. She says, if I don't see me, it won't be me. And that's very important because people need to see their face in those different places that we're advertising. They need to see it in our advertising. We place it on the side of our trailers uh, in different materials that we hand out to our angling instructors. Also in some of the information that we share around tips for beginners when they're going out to fish. So we're very excited about that. Also, 
you need to be aware of some of those professionals that are out there that are people of color engaging in those outdoor activity outdoor activities the other thing that's very important is to engage diversity focused outdoor organizations and there are a number of them across the country i'll just name a few that are in texas well there's the dallas bass hookers there's the outdoor afro there's Latino outdoors, there's Hekio, which is Hispanics enjoy camping, hunting, and the outdoors. And there's also the African American Hunting Association. So I encourage you to go out and reach out to those folks, get outside of your comfort zone, reach out to them and let them help you do what it is that you want to do when it comes to reaching those diverse audiences. Carolyn Finney, who has become uh, a, a, a big influence on me, wrote a book a few years ago called Black Faces in White Places. And Carolyn shared something that I thought was very important. She said, outreach must go two ways. We need to teach others about us, but we also need to learn about them. There has to be reciprocity for that relationship to be long-term. She also said, there's no universal story. My experience in the outdoors is going to be different from yours. And we shouldn't try to force folks to just assimilate to those things that we enjoy doing. We have to examine our own biases about what we do and ask ourselves this question. Do you want to be comfortable or do you want to be better? I'll leave you with this statement by one of my favorite authors. And this is something that kind of drives a lot of the things that I do. And hopefully it will inspire you as well. It's by James Baldwin, and he said this years ago, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you for your time. Hopefully you gleam something from this presentation that's helpful to you on your journey. And I look forward to the Q&A session a little later on in our workshop. Thank you, David. Our next panelist is Erica Nelson. Erica wears a couple of different hats in the diversity arena and is gonna to speak to both. She's a diversity and inclusion consultant that specializes in organizational and leadership development. Erica also hosts the Awkward Angler podcast and is co-founder of Real, Reconcile, Evolve, Advance, and Lead Consulting, based in Ancestral Ute territory currently known as Crested Butte, Colorado. Erica is a self-taught fly angler who's passionate about sharing her learning process and journey. She's an avid whitewater boater, a national outdoor leadership school instructor, and ambassador for brown folks fishing, which cultivates community for people of color in fishing and its industry through a lens of equality, justice, and inclusion. She has served as co-chair for the Access and Inclusion Gap Year Association Committee and is a board member for Native Women's Wilderness and High Country Conservation Advocates. Welcome, Erica. Hi, my name is Erica Nelson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the co-founder of Real Consulting, which stands for Reconcile, Evolve, Advance, and Lead. I'm also the podcast host of the Awkward Angler podcast, which is an authentic series talking about social justice, fishing, uh, and storytelling with folks within the outdoor industry. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm here to quickly chat about a little bit about my experiences and hopefully leave you with some tips on welcoming diverse audiences to the water, um, why it's important and where to start. And part of the awkward journey here, uh, I always like to say my Instagram uh, that I started two years ago at Awkward Angler is uh, really a twofold uh, meaning. So first, learning how to fly fish is not always easy. I didn't learn how to fish till my 30s, and so, uh, and I never really grew up outdoorsy as well. So learning how to fish and learning how to do it by myself was a little awkward. And I also didn't understand uh, that catching more trees than fish was common, and this was also a common image of getting tangled um, with my line and leader and not knowing uh, when to clip it and when to give up and <laughs> etc. So all those elements of learning how to fish um, are um, definitely awkward. Falling in the river, definitely normal, definitely awkward. 
Um, also, the second meeting is uh, I immediately noticed the lack of representation and lack of folks that look like me. So as an indigenous woman of color, I didn't see many folks um, out on the water. So when I started talking about social uh, social injustice within the fly fishing industry, it gets awkward and there's a lot of emotions. There's a lot of hard conversations to be had and it's not always easy to approach. So some of the things that I have faced um, in getting into fishing was not having a mentor. So I heavily relied on YouTube and then I also started my Instagram account to uh, find people that not only looked like me, but were also welcoming and accepting of all of the questions that I had um, in regards to getting into fishing. So a little bit on some barriers that I have faced um, in getting into fishing. The left photo is just for fun. I <laughs> don't know anything about like where fish live, uh, how to wade, et cetera. So that was definitely my first year of getting into fishing. And I just like the awkward image. The one on the right is my cousin Amos. He's actually one of the first people to take me fishing. So uh, that's the Animus River in Durango, Colorado. And uh, just having a family member, one, someone that looked like me and someone that is blood related, someone that I can feel comfortable and safe with, uh, took me on my first um, fly fishing wading trip. So uh, I love this image because he, we still get together and fish on the San Juan when we can um, and meet up whenever we can as well. This next image is uh, one that kind of cracks me up a little bit. This was at an outdoor um, a fly fishing conference in Missoula, Montana. And I don't think I really even need to zoom in to identify that no one looks like me. <laughs> There's maybe a few women uh, in the photo, but typically the industry is fairly homogenized. And when we look at imagery and representation, uh, these are the folks behind the industry. Uh, these are the folks in marketing. These are the teams leading organizations that have companies in the fly fishing space. And uh, obviously they've welcomed their community there and their community all looks the same which I kind of like to see the opposite of the feelings that I had in my previous slide of feeling safe, welcome, having fun. This was very stiff, not welcoming, not fun, and sometimes didn't really feel safe. So um, those are just some issues um, that I immediately noticed um, getting into fishing. So if we move on to a couple of barriers here, I kind of like to break them up into two different types of barriers. So what are we dealing with here? Is this a technical issue? Um, on the right has technical, so it has a clear problem def defined that has a clear solution. So the onus is on the authority figures and experts to apply the solutions. So taking, for example, how to read water, how to learn how to fly fish. That's pretty actually technical. Um, you know, there's science behind it. There's very much different types of gear that go behind that science and learning how to read water, where to place your fly, fish behavior, um, et cetera. That's very technical and you can basically figure the solution out because there is research and uh, data behind those solutions. If we look on the left and have adaptive um, barriers that requires um, um, that requires learning to identify the problem and the solution. If we don't actually take the time to learn that there are problems, then we actually don't take the time to figure out solutions as well. So the onus is on all stakeholders to apply the solutions. And some of the adaptive barriers that I faced was there is almost like this unspoken rule book or this unwritten rule book <laughs> of the culture in fly fishing. And so how to press and work through that has been extremely difficult, uh, which is also why I started my Awkward Angler account was to reach um, more diverse audiences and, you know, educate folks um, instead of um, bullying or instead of threatening them or instead of um, making them feel unsafe or unwelcome. Um, I had to create my own um, solution because I identified a problem. When we look at diversity and inclusion and anti-racism work, um, that requires adaptive solutions. So often we are so focused in our own uh, community, our own groups of folks that we feel comfortable and confident with. So sometimes we don't know these solutions. So if this is all we know is this photo here, <laughs> we're not really expanding our thought, our creativity, and how to reach diverse audiences because this is all we know. So if we look at 
how to have more adaptive, you know, um, solutions to adaptive problems, we kind of need to educate ourselves. So where do we even start? Um, so I always like to say adaptive solutions um, requires a new paradigm of thinking. So that can be really difficult for folks, especially if that isn't something that we're used to when we're so used to having strategy, campaigns, data, uh, all of this technical stuff with a technical solution where we can easily see. But when we're looking at reaching diverse audiences, this requires a new paradigm of thinking. We have to be creative in how we approach this type of work. We also need to create and maintain and invest in networks of accountability. So how are we actually staying involved in building community? A little bit more on how to approach adaptive uh, challenges and where to start. So the Angling for All pledge was co-created by Real Consulting and Brown Folks Fishing. Uh, so this is to help establish a benchmark in the outdoor industry to, um, or the fishing industry, to welcome everyone on the water. And we kind of like to put it into three different stages. So the first one is reconciling our own identity. What is our access to resources? How do we move about the world? How do other people move about the world as well? And what we're really doing and what we're really getting at is building compassion and empathy. Once we figure out how we move about the world and how other people move about the world, we're able to see and identify adaptive challenges and we're able to create adaptive solutions. So then the second stage is building community. So once we have compassion and empathy and figure out how other folks move about the world, we're able to build and bond and build relationships. So I'm incredibly thankful, shout out to Stephanie of Take Me Fishing for inviting me here on this, um, to spend time with you and to reach out to me on Instagram and start building community. Um, this is all rooted in uh, authentic relationships when we are looking at diversity and inclusion. Whenever we have this lens of uh, being in a relationship with people, we can then advance and lead the industry. So we're able to um, build partnerships, build networks, um, have each other's backs, if you will. And uh, typically marginalized folks of color um, will prioritize the relationship over profit. So that is also part of that mind shift of, of the, adopting a new paradigm of thinking because we're so focused on ROI, we're so focused on our strategies and our check boxes that we love so much. <laughs> Unfortunately, this work uh, is, yeah, is quite opposite <laughs> of having a checklist and, and uh, requires that adaptive solution making. So how to lead authentically, uh, leveraging social media, huge. Uh, it's why Brown Folks Fishing was created, was to build more representation on the water. It's why I started my Awkward Angler account. I have been able to uh, teach and coach and uh, take more people out on the water just by social media. And building relationships and reaching new audiences um, has been um, incredibly a, a great journey. So um, definitely happy to share more tips and tricks on how to reach diverse audiences um, and doing that authentically as well. I also encourage you to avoid performative or bandwagon activism. A great example of that was June 2nd of 2020 of Blackout Tuesday, where we saw organizations in the outdoor industry posting black squares when They've had uh, folks of color working for them for so long that have, you know, we're kind of calling them out a little bit of where have you been? You've never had my back. I've never, you know, I've been discriminated against in this organization to also what have they done or spoke about in the past? What relationships do they have? Uh, folks of color, we talk, we, we can able easily recognize what's authentic and what is not. So avoiding performative and bandwagon activism is uh, definitely uh, something that we can identify immediately if, if uh, it's authentic or not. I also encourage um, exploring people of color coalitions. So that is building relationships. And uh, that is also not reinventing the wheel. So there are organizations out there already doing great work. So it really doesn't require a whole lot of of uh, technical um, decision making here when there are already coalitions out there that exist. How do we build relationships authentically with them to build community? 
Um, also focusing on relationships and community over profit. Again, that new paradigm of thought, it's really difficult to sometimes wrap your head around. Um, however, that's how you're also gonna build relationships and lead authentically um, with folks of color. Meeting people where they're at as a, opposed to expecting them to come to you. So we like to create these awesome shiny campaigns <laughs> as marketers, yet um, folks of color are already doing their thing, how they're comfortable and how they feel safe. So how can we meet them where they're at um, as well? And then embracing cultural differences can also be a new paradigm of thought. Um, whenever we're working with diverse audiences, particularly folks of color, when we look at leading with a sense of urgency, for example, um, that can really push away diverse audiences. Uh, for example, in my Navajo culture, we like to say um, running on Indian time, which is which means if we have an event at noon, say, for example, um, but folks don't start showing up till like maybe 2 p.m., maybe 4 p.m., and nobody gets offended, and we don't see that as a sign of as, as disrespect. So when you're looking to partner and build community, you're going to have these clashes, um, and learning to recognize and identify them is going to be super helpful in moving forward and building community. Thank you so much for this quick uh, time slot that I had. You can reach me, um, email is there um, on Instagram at Awkward Angler and our website there at consultreal.org. I'm looking forward to the Q&A um, with you here shortly. Thank you, Erica. And thanks again, David. I hope you enjoyed this session. I think we can open it up to questions now. Great job. That was terrific. Really, really good. Really interesting session. A uh, lot of great uh, interaction in the chat as well. David, thank you uh, for joining us. Great to have you here. Eric as well. Stephanie, thanks for uh, stitching this together. Really cool. Um, David, quick quick question for you. Some, some of the states don't have anybody on their staff dedicated to diversity. Um, and, and if that's the case, what are some things that they can do in the day-to-day -day operations of their agency to support inclusivity and, and diversity? Well, one of the things that's very important is to make sure that your leadership is on board. Uh, if your leadership is on board, that's, I won't say half the battle, but a third of the battle. But also make sure that everything you do is focused on the mission of your agency. And also, you need to find some sponsors within your, your senior management. You've got to have folks that can help you move the needle. Otherwise, you have a lot of great ideas, and it's really good to have those great ideas, but if there's nobody to help you push that idea down the road, you're always going to have a struggle. So you've got to have some of that senior management on board, but it's more beneficial if you have somebody in senior leadership that's actually kind of carrying the torch for it and holding up the mirror to the rest of the agency. Yeah, somebody who's thinking about it every day as opposed to just part of part of their job. I can see that as being yeah. a benefit. Erica, I think you picked up some podcast subscribers and Instagram followers here in the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So uh, thank you for, for spending time being here. I, I love what you said about performative acti activism and, and everybody sort of jumping on the meme of the day and kind of wiping their hands on their pants and saying, well, we, we accomplished that. Uh, inside an organization like a state agency, how do you identify performative activism and say, you know what, this isn't enough or this is going to be viewed as uh, as, as short shrift? Is there sort of a, a filter that you can look at and say this is legitimate versus this is illegitimate? Yeah, thank you. There's a couple things that I uh, think of. One of my favorite activities is to look at the staff and the board and who's at the leadership and the top and what do their relationships look like? Uh, what does their staff look like? Um, you know, and typically if you know, I would even reach out to the person in the photo, is it a stock image or is it an actual person that has a good relationship with that person? So um, those are just some key <laughs> identifiers. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. David, you have a uh an advantage in some respect in that, as you as you pointed out in your presentation, there are a number of pre-existing organizations um, for angler diversity, outdoors diversity in, in your region that you can partner with or, or work together with in, 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 in regions that maybe don't have a lot of pre-existing uh, organizations like that. What is your recommendation? Should should the state agency try to reach out to individuals like like uh, like Erica and say, let's work on, let's build something together? Is that is that the approach? 
Absolutely. And, and there are always folks that are out there that are from different backgrounds that are doing the work that you uh, want to participate in. Uh, but you've got to be able to get outside again, outside of your comfort zone and reach out to those folks. There's nowhere across the nation where there's exclusively one group of folks that are doing anything outdoors. There's always other folks that you can engage with. And even if you can't find them, reach out to some of your adjoining states and find out who those folks and then see if they know folks inside of your state that are doing the same type of work. But it, it's out there. You just got to be willing to do the work. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit of an investigation uh, sometimes. I think that's an, an excellent point. Erica, when you are approached by an organization like RBFF, for example, like Stephanie, who, who reached out to you, what what do you like to see as kind of that first interaction? My my the reason I ask this question is is that we do a lot of influencer work and things like that. And, and I always feel like you've got to be careful about positioning that first approach as not being, what can you do for me, but instead, what can we do for you? Um, and and how, what advice do you have for our participants in, in terms of how to how to get at that in a way that isn't viewed as, well, frankly, yucky? Yeah, great question. Um, typically, not leading with asks is a really great place to start. I know that's probably on the top of your mind, and that's what you want to lead with, but building a relationship and just getting to know somebody is the baseline. That's what Stephanie did. It was just like, I just want to get to know you and your work, and can we just have a conversation? And so that's truly the, the way to kind of approach this work is authentically want to get to know me and know my work instead of um, just kind of using my photo or asking for, asking for something up front. Absolutely. It's such such good advice. You nailed that. There's a, a great book called Trust Agents um, written by a couple of friends of mine. And one of the key tenets that they have in that book is this idea that you've got to be there before the sale, right? That you have to, you have to build that relationship longer than you even think uh, before you ask somebody to, to make something happen. Um, we're going to close it up here in just a second. Stephanie, uh, any comments from you? And thanks for putting this together. No, I just, I was very excited to approach this activity or this topic uh, coming into the workshop this year. Um, you know, it's something that RBFF has embraced for a long time in an informal way, but we're trying to make it a little more formal and we want to encourage others in the industry to do so um, as well. So I'm just, I'm grateful. I've learned a lot just talking with David and Erica. I've learned some of my unconscious biases and I think that's where to start, right? It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, but um, getting a foot in the door. Well done. Thanks again to David and Erica and Stephanie and for all of you for a terrific session. Really, really nice. We appreciate you uh, and the work that you're doing. Thank you very much.